Hey folks, Rob here bringing another unboxing. So I just got this in my hands, Twilight of the Rake. This is the latest module from MMP, and it's going to be focusing on the late war, uh, like it says there, endgame European theater, 44 to 45, uh, with extra counters, as well as scenarios and some nice map boards. Let's break it open and we'll see what's what. All right, so this one's going to be a bit scuffed. My uh, camera mount just broke, so I'm going to use the handheld. So what we're looking at here is Twilight of the Rake. Uh, it's a typical three inch box. You can see it's quite large. Module number 16. Um, again, European theater, so it makes sense if you would have Americans, I guess, facing off in the city board. This one is going to involve a lot of city fighting, with scenario wise. And uh, the map boards, as you can see here in the back. Our complexity rating is high, while our solitary suitability is medium which is, I guess, to be expected for most ASL products. Complexity, um, again, given the dense urban terrain, you throw in some overlays, and it could quickly become unwieldy if you're not familiar with all the rules, hence the high complexity. So what we're looking at for contents is we have four of these 11 by 16 game boards. Now, they're double-sided, so uh, you can see it's like 17A. The other side would be 17B, and the hex numbering would be different, but it should be the same board. And the intent is this is basically two half boards butted together, and it allows for some um, unique trait feature types that you're not normally going to see. But we'll get into the boards in a second there. So we also have 48 overlays. Now, overlays are a pain. Um, you have to cut them all out. you got to keep them in certain locations so you don't get them all mixed up. Make sure you label the back as you cut them out so you know what they are. And... Um, most people are probably going to be playing this on Vassal, so it's quite easy to bring these in in that game. And what I do myself is if I'm going to play on a physical map with overlays, I will print out the map, or if it's really large, I'll take it to Staples. Any one of those supply stores like that will be able to do it for you, and they'll make me a nice poster map, uh, typical hex size, and it will have the overlays and train adjustments already made in it. So it basically looks nice and neat. Now we've got two counter sheets, so the one would be uh, New Germans, as well as the 537 second line, as well as some old ones from the past. We've got the NKVDs, we've got engineer symboled elites. So they have Americans and you have the British in this case, and you can see the smoke exponent here, it's been jumped up. And um, so yeah, two counter sheets. We have 17 scenarios and an updated rules page set. So these are going to replace the Chapter A nationalities. Um, and uh, again, we'll get into all that. So Steve Noon did the um, cover, and apparently it's from the uh, Osprey book, Siegfried Line, 44-45. Once more, we'll look at that there. Um, it is a nice painting. I do like it. All right, so uh, just pop the lid off, and as you can see, Half the box is wasted, which is not a good thing right off the bat. Um, there's no need to have a box this thick. It's extra material, it probably costs more. And you really don't have any information on the side that you need to worry about. So I really question why they would make a box that only requires half the size. Um, it comes with a typical uh, summary of everything that's on the back and some contact information. And then we'll look at the components. So first of all, we have, as I said, the nationality distinctions, chapter A25. So here we have anything with a black dot is going to be a new um, information. So in this case, for all nationalities, we have assault engineers now. Again, they have a demo charge in the top left. And their smoke exponent's already been increased for the 648. So you have your typical Germans. Now we get into the SS, 658s are a bit of a unique one. So when we come to late war SS, um, this is the kind of format that we're looking at. Um, this is reminiscent of Festung Budapest when this is first, actually no, that would be a bridge too far when this concept first came out and it was done again in Festung Budapest where you have all the ELR substitutions for SS formations. Now, um, normally, you would use, uh, for a typical game, it's 658s. However, again, we have the wide-ranging ones. So if you wanted to do early war SS, there's some scenarios out there that do use the 468. So it's not just for late war, 
but this substitution record is for late war. All right, so they've significantly expanded the SS, and we've added the new 537 Volks Grenadier. Uh, these are second line troops, 537s. It's kind of similar to the NKVD Russian 628s, which are also considered second line. So they've got a little bit more firepower. They do have spray and uh, salt fire in this case. Um, so it's reminiscent of, uh, of those kind of units. Russians, uh, I don't think we have much change there. Uh, we do add the A plus one commissar that came out in Valor of the Guards. And the rest of it should just be various nationalities because they have to change the first page, they have to change the second. So the only other thing I can see right now is, again, the NKVD and MC. These are second line troops. And on the reverse side, their broken morale is actually one higher, so they're nines on the back. So you throw them in a fanatic building with a commissar, and uh, you're looking at 10 morale second line troops. So they're quite deadly when it comes to shooting as well as close combat. Uh, you're going to have to send in at least two normal German squads to uh, deal with a 6 to 8 just to uh, improve your odds because you go in with 1, 4, 6, 7, and they're looking at 3 to 2 coming back at you and you're at 1 to 2 yourself. So, already at a disadvantage and their second line. So, alright, that's a little better. I took them out of the box. Uh, we have more Allied in minor information. Looks like we've added uh, Polish elite um, units as well as first line. They all have the Polish symbol in the top left. All right, so the Axis miners, or I should say Allied miners, are getting some loving. And then, of course, they have to do your obligatory footnotes, including the new information on Allied miners as well as. SS rules. Now we also have some terrain that's now incorporated into the rule book. Um, things like rail cars, which again came out in Valor of the Guards. Um, if you've played that campaign, the first, what, eight to ten hexes is rail cars of some type or another. And um, they had to come up with unique rules to reflect that. So we have, uh, as I said, things like gun cars. Basically think of like a building, except it. Um, they're not as large. They do allow easier movement uh, with the grain, but um, once they start rubbling and catching fire, then quickly they become impassable. <clears throat> and again, because they threw in rail cars, they have to push everything else to the right. And now we're into the footnotes itself. And basically, here we go, we're adding in some factory counters, variable height row houses, and we should be talking about the uh, yeah, real cars implementation. And debris. Debris counters are now going to be part of the game. <clears throat> Normally these only existed in the hassles, where um, as you destroy the buildings, you um, can generate debris as well. <clears throat> All right, so here we have the counters. We have one whole sheet of Germans. This is a complete SS order battle now. Right, so you can see here the, uh, the die cutting seems to be pretty straightforward. Doesn't to be any kind of errors. Um, typical good uh, MMP artwork on the units. Nice and clear, and they don't have information jammed right out to the corners so that when you use your corner rounders you're not going to be getting uh, any information off the counter itself. All right then we have a mixed bag. Here we have the Russian NKVD up top. Uh, so yeah the uh, these are not considered elites, they're second line and they have the NKVD hammer and sickle. Now when you look at the back, you'll see that the uh, morale has actually been increased to nine. And now there is an error in this sheet I just found out. Um, you can see the 628 here that are normal 628 elites with the assault engineer 
demo charge. However, when you flip it to the back, look at their back morale. They made a mistake. They've increased it to nine. These should actually be eight, not nine. So uh, it's a bit of an oopsie. And this is obviously one of the first edition printings. Uh, the later printings or redos are going to rectify that mistake. But there is errata on this out there. There's a Perry says on Game Squad that points that out, as well as I believe BBG, and of course on uh, MMP website, you'll find a list of all the errata as well. So that's the uh, Russian 628 with the engineers. Now, if you have the older games, um, Ballad of the Guards or uh, Fest on Budapest, you would have those so you can use the proper counters without the broken morale mistake. However, if you don't, just remember when you're using these Assault Engineers and Twilight of the Reich that they should have a normal broken morale of 8. So you can see the nationalities. we got Russians, we have Americans with the Engineers, and we have British with the Engineers. And you can see that, in fact, the uh, Smoke Brain Exponent has been bumped up by 2, as is for Assault Engineers. So we've also got some other... Um, factory uh, hull down markers, um, various formations you can use. Uh, I'm not sure why they added the uh, support weapons. Possibly there would have been an error in the rata. I'm not sure about that. Or they may have just been filling up space. <clears throat> They've also given us a couple of leaders. And here we have two A1 commissars. Now these counters here, these control VP, CVP, um, you're probably not going to use those because these are typically associated with uh, historical ASL. However, it appears that based on this, they're probably going to start designing more scenarios that utilize control markers of some type. And I assume on the back we have, yeah, we have the general ones in the back with the green surround. So this is more like a Hungarian color with the green and the gray on the inside. And then we've got some other uh, tanks. Add to the complement. Um, yeah, typically any ones with the green and the blue are usually associated with the Hungarians just because they've been fleshed out more. But I suppose you could use them for any uh, Axis Minor game. And we need a crap load more of debris counters because you're never going to have enough. Remember, debris is not the same as rubble. It is inherent. However, uh, it's only cost you two move, not three. And it's only a line of sight hindrance. It offers no protection of itself, just hindrances between you and the fire. Uh, WCB, I'm not sure what that term references. I'm blanking on it right now. But we do have rail car systems uh, counters as well, which you can then use for your uh, city games. So yeah, well, like I was saying, it says VBM only. Um, uh, infantry bypass can basically run down the sides of the car. However, with vehicles, it's a bit different game. You can use vehicle bypass, and you can travel the length of the rail. Typically, when you look at gaps like this, Stop using my stubby fingers. When you're looking at gaps in the symbology, um, typically that's the only place where you can actually bypass uh, in this direction to get around the rail card. And remember, if your counter width is too, um, if this gap is too small, based on your counter width, then you're not going to be able to bypass it. Looks like none of them overlap or go right to the edge of the counter. So you're always going to have some opportunity possibly for bypass depending on what's going on. All right, so we have, like I said, a lot of overlays. Uh, most of them are, well, they all are going to be designed for um, city fighting and such. So you're going to have more variations of buildings. You'll have your rails information. One ginormous uh, graveyard. That would be a normal half board in and of itself. That's huge. I'm not sure how play that's going to get this one as well. More railway. And then, of course, you have nice, really juicy ones like this, which have railways going directly into factories. We have more railways. 
yet more, as well as some more uh, building complexes. These may or may not be factories, depending on the scenario. A huge factory here. And we have a, looks like a reprint of that, or just a variation, possibly. Uh, this one's a bit shorter, but it's the same concept, RY1 and RY2. It's just one is a little bit shorter building, um, longer railway tracks approaching it. <clears throat> All right, so they've thrown in two of these in the box as well. I have absolutely no idea what they're going to be for. Um, obviously, it's mortar information, 82 and the 81. All right, so we have a lot of the scenarios. Now, I'm not going to go through these all, but one key that I've been made aware of is in the case of, let's look at the first one here. So we have last train to Leningrad. Most of these scenarios, if not all, are going to be two sheet scenarios. Um, and that's because we're going to have rather extensive SSRs, as well as we're going to have variable purchase points, which you can use to um, flesh out your army. So there's a lot of replayability from that perspective, where you can buy different things, including things like heavies for you notice that there's no support weapons in the order of battle you have to purchase them and in this case for the germans the um the red number indicates the cost uh for the whatever it is you're buying and the russians have the same capability and i believe every scenario is going to be like that so this is becoming very popular i think it started with third party purchases i know that fest and budapest module did have uh, variable purchase points, and maybe that was the genesis of it because Bill Cirillo, who designed that, was also heavily involved in this one here. You can see he's got design credit along with Sean Deller. And so uh, they no doubt implemented a lot of those rules. So this um, will offer you some variability. Every battle is gonna be a little bit different depending on what you choose. Now, as has been pointed out by other more experienced players, um, eventually there's going to be optimal selections. Most of these are going to be redundant or not going to be utilized at all. Everybody's going to go for the cheap HMG versus a, uh, uh, maybe a flamethrower, or in this case, you can get two MMGs for one HMG. However, the HMG is so much nicer, seven firepower, 16 hex range. Again, depending on the train, you may want to get that flamethrower is six. So would you rather spend six on an HMG with rates of fire or a potential one shot, maybe um, barring a 12 um, flamethrower? So again, there's going to be optimal choices that you make. Now they have in this scenario, we have 20 for the starting and we have 10 for the ones coming on. So. You could fit three HMGs. Obviously, it's putting your A's in one basket, but three HMGs are just going to be chewing up the enemy, again, depending on what your terrain is going to be looking like. So, as I said, we're not going to be going through all the scenarios. There's 17 of them. They're all going to be two-pagers, and we might even have some that have three sides. Let me see if I can find one. Uh, here's an interesting one on the back of Scenario 294, No Man, No Problem. We have a nice article here written up about a Corporal John Madison Murphy, uh, World War II veteran, joined when he's 17, Jesus. Bronze Star and Silver Star for Valor uh, commendations, very nice. So this kind of stuff is kind of interesting. It's a tie to the military, which I'm sure many of us ASL players are familiar with, probably having served to some capacity. Here's one that's three sides. Well, maybe not three sides, but we have Russians, we have uh, German, and we have Hungarians all on the same side. So this is back when most Hungarians were still fighting for the Axis. Um, there were some Hungarian units that um, were formed by the Russians to fight against their former brothers. And so there might be some um, um, Hungarian on Hungarian action. In this case, we have three sides. Now, the German and, in this case, the Hungarian are probably working together. However, there might be some scenarios where they're at odds and you have a three-way war going. All right, so flipping ahead to scenario 303, Le Mort de Chalmain. 
Um, you can see things are quickly getting out of hand. This is the SSR list. This is your VP victory condition list. Um, you gain different VP based on what's going on. Again, you have a quite lengthy victory conditions and special rules uh, two pager, and you have a looks to be a lot of counters that you could potentially buy with your purchase points. So this is starts to become um, more historical module size than a typical scenario. These are clearly not designed for tournament play. Uh, they're just too big. Although you can maybe fit something like this in. German squad types aren't that big, but when you tack on all the armor, it'd be very hard to fit something like this in um, <clears throat> in a normal tournament. All right, and here's a case of a three-page scenario card. Again, it's it quickly becomes unwieldy. Um, this is number 305, no brothers, no friends. Once more, complete page of SSRs. You have your points purchase tables, so you have Russian forces, Russian um, uh, Ukrainian forces, as well as German forces. So this might be a, a suitable three-player scenario. One person takes the Ukrainians, one takes the Belarusians, and the other one plays the Germans. So um, yeah, we're looking, uh, again, almost campaign level. And it only takes place on the one board, so. <clears throat> yeah, some of the bigger ones, obviously, are going to be a challenge. Um, the fact that they're on multiple cards, it's going to be sorting your scenarios uh, interesting because you're going to have to, unless you want to uh, lose track of them, you're going to have to play some back-to-back. -back. may throw off the counting, so depending how your OCD goes, you may find that irritating. <clears throat> All right, let's look at the boards. So these are the double white boards. Um, <clears throat> they are all folded in the middle. And again, we have repeated on the back. But you can see the hex grain has been numbered differently. We have Q to GG. And on the uh, primary side, we have A to uh, Q. So it's designed to mimic having two half boards butted up. However, uh, by putting it on one board, they're able to get continuous features uh, for the maps. <clears throat> All right, so this is going to be board 18A. And uh, again, same idea. Um, numbering is going to be A to Q, and on the back side, it'll be Q to GG. And yes, you can have nice, lengthy um, uh, village. Look at the density of this one here. Now, uh, one good thing about the house list is because they're at a fixed time and place, typically, they can include things like rubble and debris on printed actually on the map. So once you start adding in all those rubble counters and debris counters, and then you throw on flame on top of that, smoke, uh, there's almost no room for your actual counters. Uh, this is going to be very dense terrain, but the beauty of these double boards is it offers you an opportunity to have these kind of uh, large city fights in a, some factory district. Uh, so that's board 17 A and B. And then we have and then we have 16A, again, more of the same. This will probably be some kind of workers' district where you have multiple row houses. All of them are two and a half levels, and uh, line of sight is definitely going to be impacted. It even comes with its own small little chapel and uh, cemetery or two. So clearly this module is designed for European theater of operations, late war. So we're looking at getting into Germany, fighting in France, um, that kind of thing. All right, so that was Twilight of the Reich. Um, the good and the bad. So first of all, where does this fit into the scheme of things? This is not a core module, yet it's got core components. This is not a historical ASL, although a lot of the scenarios and map board design indicates that it's historical ASL. Uh, so it's a weird one to fit in. It's not noted on the box at all. Um, bad points are, again, I mean, this much material. 
in the box, the rest is air. Why make it so big? Uh, a lot of people are having these ginormous boxes on their shelves. Some people just discard the box after they clipped all the counters, put the rules where they're supposed to go. Um, <clears throat> I'm not like that. I like to keep my, my boxes. I don't know why. And uh, Thicker just takes up more real estate and really for no purpose. This, they could have fit this in the same Marie size box, not in this one here. <clears throat> um, on the other hand, it will match the other ones that they have produced when they're lining up on the shelves. They'll be the same thickness. But that's that's pretty well it for the bad. It's just the waste of space. Um, the good the map boards, uh, awesome because there's always more variability out there now. Uh, third parties are producing a lot of different map boards. Now we're getting more from MMP, and um, it just gives you more of a riding the kind of train that you're going to be fighting through. And having the double white boards on one allows you to have more of that continuous city feel rather than just a, a block of buildings and then three, four X's of gaps, another block of buildings. On the second map, you can have continuous structures, roads, railways, what have you. Um, extra counters. Extra counters are always good. Now, if you own Valor of the Guards, you don't need this. If you own Festung Budapest, it's got the exact same SS formations. You don't need this. Um, if you're a completionist like I am, then obviously you're going to get this. Uh, we have Dave a copy too, so we'll probably keep it shrink wrapped, and we'll explore mine. Um, so it's it's a uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but I, overall I do like this um, box set. Um, the five three seven second line Germans. Again, um, a lot of scenarios going forward now that that kind of stuff is in the core rules. You're going to start seeing more scenarios that are going to be implementing them. Um, again, if you're happy with what you have, there's no need to go rush out and buy this. You can wait for it to maybe come cheaper secondhand somewhere. Um, if you if you have no intention of playing those newer scenarios, that are going to be cropping up. Um, eventually, it's going to be a must-have like uh, Beyond Valor or Yanks. You're just going to need that kind of basic um, OOB layouts. So you can play those uh, new scenarios because they are really interesting. Uh, some of them could be, you know, bordering on the monster size, and if for a scenario that's maybe not good, but if you've got table space and you can set it up for a weekend, then uh, you might be able to utilize those kinds of larger games. Um, scenarios, as we said, are generally two-sided, two different sheets, so you can have them side by side. Good, bad, depending on how you sort them in your binders. And there's uh, that one three-page monster, which has, again, almost a full page of SSRs, a huge Victor condition box set, and then you have the, uh, the mini campaign uh, card as well, which tracks all your VPs that you're going to be accumulating and other stuff. So overall, I, I do like it. I think it's worth the money. Uh, if you missed out on the pre-order, that's going to suck. I think it's up to 220 now on the website, MMP's website. And if you're not living in the States, um, you can tack on exchange rate plus shipping plus maybe customs if you get dinged. I got dinged one time for an extra 30 bucks on a box. Some of them made it through. This one did not. Um, so if you have a local reseller like I used uh, Tadnack Games in Halifax, um, he was a bit delayed getting his hands on this. That's why this is coming out, what, two months after, <laughs> month and a half after it was released. But at least I have it in my hands now and I can start implementing it using it. Start clipping counters and replacing some of those ones that I really messed up on. One reason, as an aside, why I, I do like this one is the SS Order Battle. It can replace the butcher job I did on Fest on Budapest because I was using my old method of a stacking up 10 counters, slicing off a corner with an exacto knife, a look at beveled edges, some of them look like stop signs. It's really gross. So I'm going to be able to replace all those with proper clipped counters with the Oregon. Uh, I'll probably use the 2 millimeter for the small ones. Uh, I think that's the, the perfect size. Larger size corner cutters cut off too much material. Small counter, you don't want to get into that. So, a uh, bit of a ramble. Hopefully, this has made some sense. Apologies for the delay, it was out of my hands. I would have loved to have got this out in February after Winter Offensive. 
However, uh, it was not the case. So you're seeing it now. Uh, let me know what you think of Twilight of the Reich, and we'll uh, talk to you guys next video. Bye-bye.